Imagine you're at the greengrocers, and there you place a huge bunch of uh, grapes on the scale and get a nasty surprise. Because the number shown on the scale is not what you expect. But you'd, you need the grapes, but you'd hate to pay too much. Um, so you think to yourself, never mind. But then you notice the greengrocer looking in your direction, and he's looking too intensely at you, you think. And to make, mat make matters worse, he's holding a large wad of cash in his hand, which by now you're thinking he's probably appropriated from the poor fools who, so who stood there before you. But little does the greengrocer know that you are no fool. You know something about collective intelligence. And now you plan to conjure up the wisdom of the crowds right there in the greengrocer's store. Because you've watched All Against One, the blockbuster Danish game show on, based on wisdom of the crowds, and you've seen just how easily the average opinion of ordinary viewers competed with the particularly bright participants in the studio. So now you long to approach the greedy, greens, green, greedy greengrocer with accurate information and tell him about the error of his ways and his scale. So you begin to ask your fellow shoppers what they think about this bunch of grapes so that you can calculate the average opinion. And after many awkward moments, you have your answer. 875 grams. 25 grams short of the 900 shown on the scale. Now, admittedly, this 25 gram deviation is a lot less than you thought, but cheating is cheating, you think, and triumphantly, you make your way to the counter. The greengrocer has been expecting you, which obviously bugs you, but what really troubles you is what you instantly see behind his counter. It's a large pile of literature on collective intelligence, and it even includes similar works on the wisdom of crowds. And then the greengrocer speaks. I see what you've been doing, he says, but there's something that you should know. While your strategy is remarkably powerful under normal circumstances, it, and not my scale, is wrong here, because you're dealing with an item far from our typical experience. And then he begins to lecture. Now, we have long known that the average opinion of many people provides excellent information about the truth. But there's now reason to believe that the average opinion errors for reasons of psychology, when the magnitude uh, being presented is extreme in some way. Now, what you have to do, he almost whispers, is look at the entire distribution of judgments and not just the central tendencies. In particular, you have to look at the way judgments skew or slant, because that's information that you can use to infer when the average opinion is erroring. You could say, concludes the knowledgeable greengrocer, that skew is a cue for our collective error and with that, you can do even better, perhaps even as well as my mechanical scale. Now, the greengrocer is correct, and that's important for all the reasons why um, good decisions and good judgments matter in our lives. But let me explain why he's correct and turn to the question of significance as I conclude my talk. And along the way, I'll invoke three things. An old probability machine and two psychological theories. Now, psychologists have long established that when we face the same magnitude many times, our judgments is subject to variation. It's kind of like when you go home from work and it, the 30 minutes it actually takes sometimes feels longer and sometimes feels shorter. And the probability machine I'm invoking does an excellent job in capturing this uh, phenomenon. It was invented and built by the half-cousin of Charles Darwin, Sir Francis Galton, in 1873. Now, Galton called his machine the quincunx, but we'll just call it the Galton board. It consists of displaced rows of pins at the top and equally spaced uh, compartments at the bottom that serve the purpose of capturing balls that have dropped into and uh, dropped through the machine. Now, you may think about the individual path of, of a, such a ball as um, a line of thought in the cognitive process. And you may think about the particular compartment that a ball ultimately settles into as an estimate of magnitude. In our case, an estimate of weight. Now, along the way, this um, thought process is disrupted by random events, as captured by balls that hit pins in the otherwise straight fall. And um, where exactly this uh, ball will ultimately end up, um, we cannot actually predict for certain. 
But we can say something about the pattern that emerges when we drop many balls into the system, one after the other. And that pattern, you might know, it's a famous bell curve, but the bell curve is symmetric, and skewed judgment distributions occur much more frequently than predicted by the Galton board. And so we must change it in some way in order to learn why that is. And the first change that we make to the Galton board is to combine it with what's called adaptation level theory, according to which we become used to the typical magnitudes of our experience and presume these magnitudes as we then confront new items. In our case, we become used to the typical weight of a bunch of grapes from our shopping experience. In the setting of the, the Quincon, or the Galton board, this implies that the ball begins its journey um, starting at a magnitude that is uh, typical. In our case, let's assume that's um, 500 grams. But of course, there's often important differences between the particular and the typical. And the second change that we make to the um, Galton board is to assume that people will try to account for these differences and do so according to what's called sequential sampling theory. Now, the basic idea here is that what we judge has features, and these features contain information. And this information is consistent with one of two hypotheses that relate to the typical value. In our case, heavier than typical or lighter than typical. For example, a bunch of grapes can have um, particularly plump fruits, which would tend to suggest that we're dealing with an item that's heavier than typical. But that same bunch of grapes can have um, uh, particularly sparse fruits in places, which would suggest, suggest the opposite. Now, the, uh, these features um, are now captured by the rows of pins in the Galton board with the probability of a, a ball moving in the same direction as the evidence provided by the particular feature, capturing the expertise or the adeptness of the judge at the task. For example, a wine producer will be much more adept at extracting useful information from a bunch of grapes than will your typical shoppers. So it's by combining the Galton board with adaptation level theory and sequential sampling theory that we finally reach um, the augmented quincunx, or the AQ for short. And the AQ can tell us why skew is a cue for our collective error. The AQ predicts that when the percent and magnitude is um, typical then for the people in the crowd, then these people form, um, the, the um, average opinion of these people will be perfectly aligned with the truth, irrespective of how they use information. Moreover, the judgment distributions they together form will be symmetric. Under these circumstances, the wisdom of the crowds is almost magic. But when the percent and magnitude is in some way extreme, then how we use information matters for both collective error and for skewness. In actual fact, it's when we have some level of expertise that skewed judgment distributions are predicted to occur in the first place. It's almost like a, a swarm of birds where the majority head towards one clear direction, but a few laggards trail behind, leaving the impression of a, a long tail in the distribution. So for example, when the percent of magnitude is smaller than typical, um, then these, the swarm, not of birds, but of judgments, head towards small values, whereas it heads towards large values when the percent of magnitude is, is, is larger, as in the case of the greengrocer's store. And you might think, that, well, that's all well and good. But in both cases, the average um, is dragged down by the tail end of this distribution in an unfortunate way. And because skewness, well, and that, that brings me to the final um, most important point of my talk, namely that the dis deviation between um, the truth and the average opinion systematically varies with this uh, observable skewness. And that's because it's observable that we can simply say, that skew is a cue for our collective error. Now, you might think measuring the weight of a, a, a bunch of grapes is using the collective minds of shoppers is a simple and perhaps impractical um, you know, example. But looking more broadly, using modern information technology, we can now hope to harness the wisdom of crowds much more efficiently than we have previously done, now that we know that skew is a cue for error. Indeed, doctors, managers, and even politicians who care about the facts would do, look, do well to look at the entire distribution of judgments, because that might just save their patients, earn them a higher profit, or increase the welfare of citizens by bringing these important decision makers closer to the truth. So it doesn't matter if you're buying a bunch of graves or if you're running a country. If you want to know the truth, then skew is your cue. <laughs>